Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. I hope there's not too many uh, sore heads in the audience, but I'm very excited uh, for this chat uh, that is about to happen here. Um, I'm joined by Neha Narkere, and Neha, you've got such an impressive list of, of achievements. Uh, the original creator of the uh, Apache Kafka, you're an investor, uh, you were co-founder and board director at Confluent, a company which has gone public, and we're going to talk about that journey as well. You've recently co-founded Oscillar as well. So there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot of entrepreneurs and investors probably in this audience that want to hear that journey and learn how to build, scale and eventually IPO uh, a successful business as well. Let's start it out from your days at LinkedIn where you were developing uh, Apache Kafka. Um, just quickly obviously run us through what it is in case anyone doesn't know. Uh, but just want you to talk about that journey. What did you identify at the time that led you to think, hey, this is a good solution? Yeah, so LinkedIn, uh, the experience was really cool. I joined LinkedIn in the hyperscaling years of LinkedIn. And uh, at LinkedIn, I'm sure everyone's used it. We offer 24-7 data-rich experiences. But it turned out when I was there that the back-end data infrastructure did not allow data to be used in real time. And so that was a big problem. So initially, we didn't want to create Apache Kafka at all. We began by looking at you know, external systems, and nothing would scale to hyperscale real-time data. And so we created Kafka with a fundamentally different architecture that allowed it to work at hyperscale in real time. And uh, we thought that it wasn't just LinkedIn's problem. You know, the whole world was trying to move to real-time data products. And so we open sourced it. And uh, in a three to four year time period, it got used at thousands of companies. And today it's used by more than 80% of the Fortune 500. So it was a very exciting journey after open sourcing it. When you were developing it, you were trying to solve a specific problem at LinkedIn. Did you, was there a moment when you thought, oh, hold on, this could be a big commercial product, a good commercial opportunity? Did you even think it would be used that wide when you open sourced it? You know, over a period of time, I was recognizing that it was becoming more and more popular in the Silicon Valley tech circles. But I uh, vividly remember uh, a time when I was sitting in a conference room with my co-founder, and we were answering questions helping a Fortune 500 company with their use of Kafka for a very mission-critical application. So as he was answering one of the questions, I just sort of sat back and thought, OK, we are helping a Fortune 500 company for free. So there is a business opportunity there. And because Kafka is open source, anyone could have started the Kafka company. Mm. And so I'm all about regret minimization. And so I thought, OK, if I wasn't the person who started it along with my co-creators, then I'm going to regret it very much years down the line. And so I started it, uh, and I proposed it to my co-founders who agreed to do that. They were thinking about it at the same time. We started it in 2014, and it went public in seven years. So today, it continues to be a very exciting journey for me. Mm. Um, what, what about that experience? I mean, at the time when you were developing, LinkedIn wasn't as big as it, as it is now, but it was still a fast-growing organization as well. How do you develop something like this within a large organization like LinkedIn, where there's certain unique challenges and, and opportunities too. Yeah, um, so in LinkedIn, uh, we, at least I was working there during the scaling years, but we are still only 300 employees. And uh, when uh, a company is growing that quickly and that is small at that time, everyone has to do more than what they were doing. So I was in initially hired to work on search at LinkedIn, but uh, you know, I noticed that the biggest problem that the company had was data infrastructure. And what was unique about LinkedIn is they encouraged open source software. So they were encouraging us you know, to support our decision to open source Kafka. And so that was you know, the reason, and that is the philosophy that I developed, is as long as you work on the biggest problem the hyper growth company is experiencing, you have a much better chance of making an impact. And so that was you know, the story of how Kafka was both developed, who grew, as well as became open source because of LinkedIn's culture. Do you think it's possible to, to create that kind of innovation within 
large organizations, thousands of, of employees? That's an interesting question. So, um, you know, the greatest technologies are created where the company has a culture of encouraging mm -hmm. innovation from the bottoms up and where there is a real problem to be solved. So it's less likely that companies are going to invest in something that is just a fringe technology, right? Solving a small problem, just practically from the top down, it doesn't make sense. So as long as it's going to solve a big problem for a big organization, and it has a bottoms up culture, by the way, very few companies have that kind of culture, it is possible, I think, to create a technology like Kafka. But there's, there's certain, uh, I guess, culture that needs to be fostered Absolutely, First. absolutely. A developer-driven culture where developers are empowered, have extreme ownership of the problem from the bottoms up, I think it is possible. Um, I just hope there were more companies that uh, encourage that kind of uh, culture in an organization. And Neha, you've alluded to it, but Apache Kafka was open source, but with Confluent, you had to figure out an enterprise-grade ready product uh, that you could commercialize in Confluent. Um, what were, how did you go about that? And were there any unique considerations? Yeah, definitely. So at Confluent, one of our core values was customer obsession. And Confluent was very unique because it's an open source technology based organization. So we both had to keep the users of an open source community happy as well as develop an enterprise customer base who would be commercially happy about the product. And so we developed a culture where there was a culture of you know, open sourcing uh, features that would help a developer get started with using Kafka, but then develop a proprietary feature set that would help you know, companies become successful with you know, things like security, management, at scale. So that was really unique about Confluent is we were able to balance both you know, happy community of open source users as well as happy set of commercial customer base. Yeah. Uh, we'll get on to a bit more about Confluent and the eventual IPO of that company. Uh, but you, you built uh, Confluent, went public, and now you're, you're working on Oscilla, uh, another company you co-founded as well. Why was now the right time to, to jump into something like this? And maybe just give us a quick brief about about Oscillar? Yeah, so Oscillar is an AI risk decisioning platform to help consumers keep safe and help companies fight financial crime. And uh, the connection is very interesting between Confluent and Oscillar, although they are in different types of technologies or different markets, there's a very strong connection. And I saw at Confluent that one of the biggest use cases of Kafka and Confluent on a dollar basis is in the fraud and risk space. And the big technology, uh, you know, the big trend that was driving it is AI-driven fraud. And because there was AI-driven fraud and a lot of data is required to, you know, process all that uh, data and information and make decisions in real time, I developed a, you know, core experience of working with the largest banks, fintechs, payment processors to solve their problems. That's when I realized that it is not a fintech fraud problem, it is a data AI technology problem. And that is why Oscillar was created. Yeah. And what, what have been some of the learnings, I guess? So have you approached Oscillar differently to the way you approach Confluent? What did you learn from Confluent that you're now taking uh, into Oscillar as you, as you do this again? Yeah, this is interesting. So there were lessons from Confluent. There are some parallels, and then there are some you know, obvious differences. So the parallels is the culture of customer obsession, You know, making sure that the product roadmap is driven by not just strategic goals of the company, but also customer centricity. So that's one. But the second big one is category creation. You know, category creation is something we were able to successfully do at Confluent, where we not just created a different product, we changed a mindset. We changed how people think about real-time data. Mm. And that is what we're doing with Oscillar as well, is we're changing how people think about financial crime. We're changing how AI and data can be brought together in real time to fight fraud in a very, very different way. And so the big trend there is the AI trend of creating fraud, but the bigger trend is also after the COVID pandemic, almost every industry had to move to an online transaction. And as long as you have an online transaction, you have a risk problem to be solved. 
And so the market is very, very big for a company like Oscillar, but the trends were very much AI-driven fraud and the COVID pandemic. Yeah, you've mentioned, you mentioned AI and the trend there. Let's pick up on that thread. When you, we've seen obviously massive developments around generative AI, large language models, et cetera, over the past couple of years. How has that changed the way or, or has it changed the way in which you approach building a business? Different, of course, to the time when you were building Confluent. Yeah, um, you know, every decade or so, there is a big innovation that completely transforms our lives and completely transforms how we operate, right? And today, uh, in the world of generative AI, that is that technology. Uh, I think it is not just a technology advancement, it is a completely transformative force that is changing every industry, every problem space. Uh, I think that there are a couple of things about generative AI that companies are using. First of all, it is changing risk management in a big way so you can detect new forms of fraud much faster than ever before. But it's also operating, you know, it's also uh, eff efficiently changing how humans do tasks. Yeah. You know, for example, there are uh, companies that are developing and deploying AI-powered chatbots that produce, uh, you know, customer service 24-7. At the same time, you know, that is uh, how we use uh, generative AI at Oscillar is to create agents, is to create co-pilots to make fraud fighting go much, much faster. Mm. So there's a lot of potential in generative AI. It's just that, especially in the risk management space, we think a lot about bias. We think a lot about transparency of the models. And so uh, the ethical deployment of the technology is also, I think, equally important. Yeah, so if you're a founder sort of now, um, what kind of considerations do you need to have when you're thinking about bringing AI into your business? The first thing is talent. I think uh, it's a fast-moving space. Uh, most of the problems or the solutions are pretty much unknown. Mm. The research, uh, you know, kind of culture of innovation has to be developed. So it's not just about educating a workforce or attracting the talent. There has to be a culture of innovation and openness to adopting the technology. So there are concerns, as we know, around job displacement. There are cultures around uh, safety of the technology. But there's a huge opportunity. And so a focus on that opportunity along with uh, you know, balancing it to ethical considerations is a big way in which we can embrace that technology. Mm. Now, can I just ask you to step back a minute and talk about the broader market and hype at the moment? Because you told me here it's transformative technology. Everyone's told me it's a transformative technology this year. The technology is the one part. The, the market's another. When I look at companies raising astronomical sums of money early on, I look at the valuations that are, that are coming in this market, uh, particularly in the private side, and then you look at the public markets and you look at Nvidia tripling its stock price this year alone, are we in a bubble? <laughs> um, I, I might from, have a from, from a market funding point of view, rather than the tech point of view. Yeah, uh, contrarian point of view, but we are definitely in a bubble. When I look at the venture funding that uh, goes into and the valuations that go into, you know, quote unquote generative AI powered products, uh, they're uh, you know huge, much much bigger than the you know the value placed on. Equally important, you know, enterprise technologies that do have potential of success. Yeah. So, from a, just from a venture perspective, there's uh, almost too much of a hype. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we know, there will only be a couple of clear winners. But uh, the funding for essentially anyone who utters those words is is actually pretty high. Yeah, it's uh, everyone putting. It was like the equivalent of everyone putting blockchain somewhere in their company a few years ago. Now we're having everyone with a now AI Now we have a there. corrective phase. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, you, you, you make a good point. It's, it's about the, the, the sustainable businesses, real businesses. When we look at the landscape now, you think about who's making money from AI. It's the infrastructure players right now. It's the yes. NVIDIAs, the hyperscalers of the world, and their cloud businesses, which are growing quickly. But there's not a next level layer to that yet. Um, are you seeing new business models emerging at this point, or are we still experimenting, figuring out what that next layer looks like, who's going to make the money off this. And I, I'm sure you're hoping, hoping it's Oscillar as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, as an angel investor as well, I've yeah. seen a lot of exciting companies emerge. 
the business model i think is uh, you know kind of up in the air uh, people are going to experiment like with every big innovation uh, the adoption patterns are different the buying patterns are different and ultimately the go to market strategy should align with the adoption and buying patterns so that's what i think has to be carefully considered so if i were to contrast my experience with Confluent and Oscillar. Confluent is a very developer-oriented, bottoms-up, go-to-market motion. Very different from Oscillar, where the risk teams are top-down. It's a very sales-driven motion. So really knowing your customer base, doing that market research on what the adoption buying patterns are is what will bring success. But we are still in that you know, phase of evolution, which is, which is very natural with something as new as uh, AI, especially generative AI. And just the last one on AI, you mentioned the responsible and ethical considerations when developing this technology. As a company who, who is working with this technology, how do you approach that? Is it something you feel that the companies themselves should be in charge of, or does there need to be regulation alongside this? Uh, interesting question, because uh, there is a balance between regulation as well as uh, you know, companies doing the right thing. Uh, I think that regulations uh, need to be thoughtful in order to balance what is right for public interest as well as something that will encourage innovation. So uh, I, I'm supportive of thoughtful regulations. I just think that industry leaders and regulators need to work together yeah. rather than in separation. But uh, from a cul cultural perspective in a business, there needs to be a culture of responsible innovation. So I'll give you an example at Oscillar. One of the problems we solve is credit risk. And uh, bias is extremely important of a consideration there because mm. you definitely do not want to rule out a certain demographic. Yeah. That is something we take very seriously is you know, bias analysis, testing methodologies, explainability frameworks. Mm. That is something that's very important. We take it seriously. We talk to regulators about our approach. So I think that it is a balance, but industry and regulators have to work together. Mm. Um, Neha, let's talk a bit about raising money then uh, as well. I read this post recently by Mike Volpe from Index, Index Ventures when he was talking about Confluent and he said of, of, of your team, the first meeting revealed them to be thoughtful, humble founders that dreamed big. After 15 minutes, I had the strong sense that Confluent was going to be an important company in the enterprise software ecosystem. Oscillar, as I understand it, is self-funded for now. Um, but do you have any tips for companies looking to raise money? How did you convince Index Ventures that you, know, you, you, you guys were the real deal? Uh, well, for Confluent, it was a little uh, different of a story. It, it becomes obvious when there is a user base that is in the thousands, and there is a company where, you know, um, luckily investors like uh, Index Ventures found us to be humble and have potential enough. But that's more of an obvious decision, yeah. right? There, there is a user base. Uh, with, with Oscillar, we will think about it differently. I think you know, the, the big learning is when you're f uh, looking for investors, look for a partner, right. not just funding and the money aspect of things because they're going to help you make big, big decisions. Mm -hmm. So really, I think much more than the firm, I think the person is very important. Right, and it, does that mean also looking at strategic options as well in terms of investment, just, not just sort of necessarily VC? Absolutely. Yeah. I think in some companies, the strategic option is extremely helpful. You know, in particular with uh, big banks, yeah. in uh, the venture arms can be particularly helpful in breaking through. Uh, and so strategic investors are equally important as the tactical ones, ultimately still looking for a partner. So from raising funds to, to going public in the IPO markets, I think Confluent went public in 2021, I think. Yes. Um, you're probably not anywhere near that stage with Oscillar. But what are some of the, the key things you think about or look for when considering to, to take a company public? Uh, so one thing is market and uh, you know, how big the market is, how big the opportunity is, but also how pressing the problem is. You know, is there a commercial opportunity there? So proving to yourself, to others, uh, and uh, being able to uh, you know, have repeatability in the company and growing motion is, is one of the big things. Uh, second thing is, uh, you know, uh, do, you, do you have that kind of data points that prove that you're able to grow a sustainable business? So as we all know today, uh, the market really does value sustainability, capital efficiency. I think those are equally important things to balance along with growth. Uh, there are a few things, and then timing above everything else. You know, uh, today we are not quite 
in a market that is going to encourage, uh, uh, you know, just about okay kind of companies going public. So from an uh, IPO readiness perspective, timing is also just practically one of the important things. Yeah, I was going to ask, have, have the markets changed? It feels to me, you know, we watch, we watch tech stocks every day. Tech investors are a little bit more discerning about the companies they want to invest in. It's no longer these kind of high growth, but high cash burning, unprofitable companies. Profitability is is now buzzy and sexy. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. I think um, in 2021, we, re we remember in 2020 as well, there was a much more emphasis on growth at the cost of profitability. Yeah. I mean, still the hyper growth companies are still going to be unprofitable, but the path to profitability and the time to profitability and the metrics that uh, you know demonstrate the quarter over quarter mm. uh, progress towards that profitability is important. I, I wouldn't say that uh, growth is, you know, less of a factor. It's just they're looking for sustainable growth in the long term. Yeah. And as you prepare for an IPO or if you're thinking about an IPO even early on, how do you create the right team uh, to, to, cr to realize that opportunity and eventually get you to that goal? I think, uh, you know, just from a leadership perspective, uh, at that point, you're trying to minimize unknowns and trying to get people who mostly have done it before, especially from a financial go-to-market perspective. So that, from a leadership perspective, I think it's a responsible thing for the company to do, mm -hmm. is to evolve the leadership to people who have done it before. And the second thing is responsible controls. Right? Uh, have you had you know, the time, investment, the experience of people who will put the right controls in place in order to you know, be ready to go public? Yeah, and w since we're here in Europe, we should talk about it. Europe's public markets for, for tech have been almost non-existent, really. Um, are there opportunities in Europe in terms of being able to become a serious hub of capital markets uh, for large technology companies, in your view? You know, I think there is a lot of potential. If you just look at venture funding in 2023, uh, cumulative venture funding in European startups was 52 billion, uh, and which was quite a jump three years ago. So there's definitely a, a lot of potential. I see a lot of interesting European startups coming up. They're growing fast. Uh, surely we haven't seen the big IPOs yet, but they're on the horizon, I think, in the years to come. Does, does, does sort of the explosion of AI uh, present Europe with opportunity, you know, because European tech really missed out on the platform age, the, the internet age in many ways. It's the big US companies that dominate uh, that space. Does generative AI give European startups a new opportunity, do you think, to, to create these sort of multi-billion dollar companies? You know, it's interesting. My perspective is uh, Europe's focus on uh, data privacy, Europe's focus on ethical considerations, responsible AI. Just that is going to put European startups at a slight advantage when it comes to especially serving industries that put a lot of emphasis on privacy and, and responsible innovation. So uh, from the readiness perspective, from a cultural perspective, I think there's definitely potential in European startups to, you know, I wouldn't say rival, but catch up to the market in the US. Yeah. Um, now we've got a couple of minutes. So I just want to talk a bit more about your experiences as an entrepreneur. Um, I read out your big list of achievements at the start. Were there any moments along that journey uh, where you had doubts? Can you, can you pinpoint any of those moments and how you overcame them? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, at, um, I would say, while growing Confluent, uh, there was a unique situation there, which is uh, the big transition was the move to the public cloud, just happening in the world. Uh, serious, you know, big enterprises were still in that sort of doubtful phase where there, there was a five-year plan to go to the public cloud, but not so much a one-year plan, right? But at the same time, Kafka was everywhere. So if we said that we were only a cloud SaaS-based product, we would have missed out and created competitors. So the timing of creating the cloud product was quite something as a CTO I was concerned or doubtful about because it's almost like building two different products, two different businesses within the same company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the timing of introducing the public cloud product was one of those moments where we took the right decision, but it was uh, in the first two years, I think, one and a half year, which is quite crazy for a startup to do. Mm. And Neha, just finally, what are you most excited about in technology over the next five years? Um, you know, at the risk of <coughs> stating buzzwords, just based on my Oscillar experience where I'm seeing interest from serious enterprises on how generative AI is creating an impact is something I'm extremely interested in. I think there's this hype today, 
but it is a technology that is completely transformed how every problem is going to be solved. And so the pragmatic, tangible value applications of the technology is something I'm super interested in. Neha, that was great. We went through a, a journey there. We went yeah. through your journey and it was wonderful. Thank you for all your insight. A really fascinating discussion there. A round of applause for my wonderful guest, Neha Narkede. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.